five according to that clock, so I guess it's time to begin. Um, we'll begin the <laughs> joint meeting for Rules and Open Government Committee and Committee of the Whole for uh, February 12th. Welcome, everyone. We have a full house here for the committee. Uh, we'll begin with a review of the draft agenda for February 25th because there's no school on the 18th. All right, we'll start with pages uh, four and five, any changes? Pages six and seven. Pages eight and nine. Pages uh, 10 and 11. Pages 12 and 13. Pages 14 and 15. <clears throat> uh, <coughs> this is a question about 8.2. Is that, is that really ready? I believe it is. Okay, that's exciting. We, we spoke right. about that this morning, yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, and pages uh, 16 and 17. Pages 18 and 19. Okay. Any comments? We have some ads. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, request from my absence uh, is item 2.4. Motion to approve the agenda for Tuesday, February 25th, with uh, including a sunshine waiver for an ad sheet. Second. Mr. Beekman, would you like to speak, sir? Hi, for item uh, 3.5, city infra citywide infrastructure and deferred maintenance backlog report. Um, there was much talk here uh, at the t &E meeting, I think it was, about that report, and uh, streetlight things were mentioned. Um, I think it was mentioned by Samina Usman, I think is her name, is correct? Uh, she works for CARE and the Bay Area representative. She mentioned that in San Diego, you know, there's quite an uproar going on about uh, uh, the smart light poles that are being placed, uh, or not the smart light poles, but the, uh, the, light, the light bulbs themselves, the, the street lights themselves. And um, there's, a mu there's much of an uproar going on down there. And I, I've tried to state here before that I just wanted to remind yourselves that uh, I think good policy practices here can really uh, help uh, this, that situation, and I and I, I wonder what I don't quite know what they're doing in San Diego about that at this time. But Samina Usman of Care uh, <coughs> mentioned those sort of things. Uh, it was nice to hear, <laughs> and that uh, you know as a way to alleviate, uh, you know, to, to alleviate the situation, and uh, you know to. Uh, it's good practices, and I think good practices develop, uh, you know, trust between all parts of the community and, and, that, and those sort of things. So um, I just wanted to inform you of that. Thank you. Thank you. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that passes. <coughs> the. Uh, general plan city council hearing for 2020 is on item D. Motion to approve the schedule. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Item E is the public record. Mr. Beekman. Is there a motion? Motion to note and file. Second. All right. Um, 
I wrote a real nice letter about this that I'll send yourselves later today. Uh, I was, uh, to speak to my public record about uh, Vision Zero practices, uh, I was uh, really impressed with how everyone worked yesterday on this item, uh, the Vision Zero action plan. And uh, I'm hopeful about what we can do. I think the, uh, the Vision Zero uh, task force or committee that's going to take place quarterly starting in March is a great idea and that you want to invite the bicycle community to participate to be a part of that committee is is awesome of you that you're willing to do that and it's a great step and I, I think it's, it's my personal feeling that um, uh, I don't know how to, how to describe it, but to, to, to just continue, it's my personal feeling that uh, I can't, uh, the words can't come to me. But to continue, the community experience, we are gonna have a good community experience, and it's, I'm impressed by that. What I, what I am considering is that, <laughs> it's coming to my brain, but then I can't quite formulate it. Uh, you know, the idea is a responsibility. I think we're all learning I felt we all took a deep breath and, and thought, you know, something may be pushing a little too hard with Division Zero at this time. And I think we all took our collective breath and say, if we go slow and, can, and be considerate with each other, we can all work on something uh, important uh, in this coming year with this project. So good luck to all of us in what we're going to be working towards. And uh, thank you for your efforts. I hope, I hope that could be a part of a other city and community functions in this year. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Connell. Martha O'Connell, GSMOL Regional Manager. I rise in support of the Housing and Community Development Commission's vote to request that the council give a mobile home designation now to all mobile home parks this is also advocated by the Law Foundation and their letters started coming in in at least 2017 and we're still waiting. The current inconsistent and confusing patchwork of general plan land use for mobile home parks must be ended. The city of San Jose cannot continue to lurch from one park to the other as rumors and reality of closures come up. I will tell you that three years ago I heard about these two parks I went to the city, I asked for the names. They said they wouldn't release them to me. They said they didn't want to, quote, panic people. I went back in the record. I found an email by uh, Perales, Jimenez, and Rocha on these two parks. I called up their leadership. I said, you're not children. You're not going to panic. You're going to organize. And I released the names of those parks, and they did. They got, they got organized. So I encourage you to give all the parks a designation now and I will tell you and I don't release information until I have hard evidence I'm hearing now that there are two more parks that are set for redevelopment once I have sufficient information I will release the names and I will go to the people and I will say where is the council did they give you this designation that's going to make a difference no they're gonna run now to you and say we're concerned so please, you have a chance to do this once and for all, for all parks on the, I believe it's the 10th. Please do the right thing and give this designation to all parks. Thank you. Okay, on to, uh, on that motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. On to G1, Mr. Uh, Beekman, this is the consent calendar. And you're just going to be speaking to those items of the new Lunar New Year and the Winter Walk? Yeah, hi. To speak about the, uh, the Lunar New Year, I think that was about uh, approval of uh, funding for, for, for the Tet Festival. I was going to attend those Tet Festivals, but because of this coronavirus, I could not. And I'm kind of hurt <laughs> and angry about it. And um, I just wanted to remind uh, that, you know, the practices that I'm a part of there are very good practices that deal with issues here on the local level, and it's from these good practices that I think we can ask larger questions of our federal government, of the UN, 
and of uh, international countries, they can't practice uh, those sort of practices anymore. They can't practice disaster capitalism, shock doctrine tactics, and uh, we have the power to do that here at the local level now, and uh, with the guidelines and the practices I'm a part of, and I just wanted to remind everyone of that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Um, on the consent calendar. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, item uh, G2 is the Board of Fair Campaign Political Practice recommended revisions to city ethics and open government provisions under Title 12. Welcome, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Vonney, Deputy City Attorney. Um, I'm here today to uh, provide a brief overview of the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices uh, recommended revisions to the city's ethics and open government uh, regulations under Title 12, as well as this board's, uh, the board's rev resolution for governing its hearing procedures. Um, and so the, I'll get right into it. Uh, the first recommendation relates to the scheduling of the special municipal elections on initiative measures. Uh, in 2017, the state legislature amended the elections code, altering how uh, special elections are scheduled. Um, and that amendment has uh, the potential for unintended consequences uh, for the city because in our city charter we have a provision uh, which has never been uh, invoked but would allow um, an initiative group to uh, compel or force a special election if they uh, uh, receive a certain percentage or achieve a certain percentage of uh, signatures. And so under the elections code prior to 2017, there was a mechanism in place that allowed uh, the governing body of uh, like the city council to defer that special election to avoid having a scenario where you had to have uh, three special, three elections in a year if there was a primary or a general election nearby. Uh, so the board's recommendation is to incorporate the uh, statute in the elections code that was removed by the legislature in 2017. Uh, the second, second recommendation is a clarifying amendment to uh, the filing requirements of the Form 502. That is the form that uh, candidates have to fill out to disclose the source of their personal funds. Uh, as it says in the ordinance now, it says pre-election, uh, the, the uh, Form 502 has to be filed every time a pre-election statement is filed. That should say campaign disclosure statement. Uh, so we are, uh, the board is recommending amending that uh, ordinance to uh, conform with current interpretation. Um, the uh, third recommendation is uh, aligning the city's surplus campaign funds ordinance uh, with state law. Um, both uh, state law and uh, the municipal code regulate surplus campaigns and these are campaign funds and these are the funds that remain uh, after an election is over and, and the use of them are regulated. Um, the board is recommending changing the deadline for when campaign funds become surplus funds uh, to conform with state law as well as expanding the permi uh, permissible uses for, that fun for those funds uh, again to better align with uh, what's allowed under state law. The fourth recommendation relates to the revolving door ordinance. Uh, to remind uh, the Rules Committee, uh, this um, item came from the City Auditor. It was referred to the Board for consideration. It has to do with whether or not the revolving door ordinance should have an exemption for nonprofits. Uh, the Board considered um, the proposal and their recommendation is to remove uh, the nonprofit exemption so that uh, the revolving, or, uh, revolving door ordinance, um, which regulates what city officials and designated employees can do after they leave city office, um, would apply equally to uh, for-profit entities or, and, and non-profit entities. Um, and, and to clarify, the uh, current non-profit exemption applies uh, if the non-profit has uh, engaged in programs that have received financial or formal support from the city within the last five years. Uh, the fifth recommendation has to do with the lobbying ordinance. Again, this is a clarifying amendment, um, just um, updating the uh, requirements for what triggers uh, the, the weekly filing. Um, and again, this recommendation is to uh, conform with current interpretation of the lobbyist ordinance. And then finally, the sixth recommendation relates to the board's resolution itself. Uh, 
the board has engaged in a process where they're evaluating how they take in complaints and uh, the uh, resolution um, and the board felt that the resolution should explain to the public what areas are within their jurisdiction and which are not. And uh, this looks at the municipal code as well as follows what the FPPC does when they evaluate complaints. And then also it uh, uh, outlines the clerk's role uh, when uh, he or she receives complaints that are insufficient on their face, faith, face excuse me, and memorializes uh, a process whereby the clerk uh, rejects the complaint without prejudice. Um, asking for the complainant to specify the Title 12 violation that um, they allege has occurred and then allowing them to refile it before uh, then submitting it on to the evaluator for um, further investigation. So I'm here for any other questions if you have, but that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, just a, really a process question, uh, Rick or, or, or Dave, I guess really primarily Rick. What happens? <laughs> We've got recommendations. Well, it comes to this committee for uh, comment, essentially, and, and many uh, feedback, uh, and then deciding whether or not to move it forward to city council. All right. Uh, but I think at this point, this is the first step in the process. Um, to, and do you uh, want to apply ye red, yellow, green prioritization here uh, if there's a substantial amount of work? Or? You know, this is coming from a commission. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we do that with, com with you know, the... They review this periodically. I think uh, it's every two years. Yes, it seems, and right. they and they come forward with recommendations. So we never really use it as part of priority setting. Okay, uh, but it really is up to you uh, if you want to throw it into priority setting. And and we are, uh, I think we're scheduled to have our biennial uh, ethics review this year. Is that yeah, right? I think it was. I think it's a little bit tardy, but yeah. You, okay. You, so this could be an envelope or incorporated into that. Yeah, I think it would be helpful since we got to have one anyway, and we got to. I'm sure we're going to want to discuss some of these items. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let's uh, open it up to the committee uh, for any views. That's what I read us? Yeah. Sure. I have a question about um, number four. Uh, so, so I think it was uh, Kira who came to, I think it was rules last, mm -hmm. and asked mm -hmm. to, to be exempted from the, um, the revolving door. Um, rule, so this would this would um, not allow for that to, and, and we, I think we approved it and she moved forward and she was a, she's able now to interact, but so would this rule then now make that not possible? No, there would still be a way for the council to waive the revolving door just like you did with, um, with Kira. Yeah, th there are currently uh, provisions that allow for automatic exemption from the, re the revolving door doesn't apply. And there were some unique cases. Uh, I, the two that come to mind were Dean Monroe uh, many years ago when he went to work for the San Jose Sports Authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Pat Dando when she went to work for the, uh, cham well, the former Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. um, because the city had provided uh, aid to the, and, and had worked uh, with financial aid, uh, there was a specific exemption for those going to those nonprofits because the theory, I think, probably from the council standpoint, was they were doing the city's work uh, and so there was, it really wasn't a conflict. Um, I think that's what caused the confusion. And then so the, the board saying, hey, just treat all law profits the same. And if you want to do a yeah. waiver, it uh, has to come to, to rules and okay. the council. So yeah. no automatic. No exemption. automatic waivers. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you for the clarification. And so this will get cross reference, it sounds like. To, to the well, greater council, well, or is it up to the rules? It's up to the rules committee to decide. decide. If, if you want to get feedback and then maybe go back to the board, if, it really depends on what happens here, yeah. what you uh, want to do with it. I, I would like for this to go back to the greater council. That's just uh, my recommendation. I'd love to hear my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm interested. Uh, so you said that, the, that we're in the cycle of uh, doing a ethics review every, what, every yeah. two years? Yeah, and... and uh, it's under the charter, and the mayor leads an ethics biannual ethics review, and so any changes that independent of this that may want to be reviewed, uh, whether it's to revolving door campaign ordinances, lobbyist ordinance, any any and all the Title Twelve uh, ethics provisions. Well, it makes total sense then to incorporate this in, into that review. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Yeah. I agree. 
Councilmember Kim. Well, I agree with the vice mayor, except that I don't know when the ethics review is going to take place. So uh, why don't we give direction that there will be the <laughs> ethics review would take place sometime <laughs> this spring? Uh, that uh, give you guys enough time to be able to yeah weigh I think, in on this. Yeah, we were ready to stop that. I mean, it's a charter okay. requirement. So all right, I'll make a motion. Second. Great. So in this in this spring. Yeah. Okay. When the weather's nice. <laughs> when, the, when the weather turns hotter than this. <laughs> March twenty first. Okay. Um, I know I had a qu couple questions about these, but I think I can probably take them offline. Um, yeah, that's fine. I don't have any cards from the public on this, so we'll just vote to move this forward to the council. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we're moving forward. So, so to clarify, you say move it to council or move it to the mayor's, uh, the mayor's review and then come back to council with whatever the mayor's uh, ethics review the comes letter. back with? I thought the ethics review was at council. Am I wrong? I remember it. <laughs> well, you have to take to it to council, council ultimately. Yes. But you're making the, you, the mayor makes the recommendation. That's fine. Setting the, yeah. 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 Okay, so we'll, we'll set the date and bring it all forward. Right. Okay. And that was the intent of my motion, too. Great. Um, item item three, which is exploring procurement of poly. Uh, so, sorry, I apologize, Mayor. So, if we want other things to be considered uh -huh. um, during the ethics review, mm -hmm. uh, would how would we either communicate to me in my office within the Brown Act or uh, otherwise a memo to the council? Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's how it was done before. Before. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Uh, now we're on to item three. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Exploring procurement of poly propylene plastic purification. Say that three times fast. Okay. And recycling okay. plant to enhance uh, regional waste sustainability. Uh, Councilman Camus. Yeah, I don't know if you have any cards from the public, but we do. Uh, uh, do you like to go there first? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'd like to have them come up first. Okay, sure. Uh, Joel Corona, followed by uh, Blair Beekman. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members and Executive Staff. Uh, California Waste Solutions appreciates and commends uh, Councilman Kalmus for the memorandum to explore using uh, city land that's being vacated for downstream recycling uh, by Pure Cycle and also by, uh, Santa, by San Jose's other recycling companies that have provided and do provide collection and processing of recycled plastics. Over the past 20 years, the amount, of, the amount and the types of plastics have increased dramatically and we've risen to that opportunity to recycle them. Uh, but they've become dirtier and they've become more difficult to recycle. Uh, in 2018 and 19, the China National Sword Policy banned importing mixed plastic grades and other Asian countries have followed along suit. Uh, the greatest threat and opportunity is the recycling of post-consumer plastics, especially dirty soiled contaminated plastics. Uh, CWS uh, early focused on helping reduce the contamination of the recyclables. Uh, that was followed by nationwide programs seeking both clear, uh, excuse me, uh, clean, empty, and uh, 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 unsoiled recyclables. Um, additionally, the state of California plans on increasing the amount of recycled content that's required in new beverage containers and other containers as well. Uh, the, uh, the confluence of these three factors, the increasing amount of dirty plastics, the banning of plastics, into foreign markets and the higher post-consumer plastics required for new containers uh, provides both a wonderful opportunity and an obligation to innovate and collaborate on new infrastructure for domestic post-consumer plastics recycling. Uh, CWS is also exploring downstream recycling processing to wash, flake, and pelletize post-consumer plastics. We see value at helping the city and the region at becoming more self-reliant and more uh, self-sustainable in plastics recycling. Toward that goal, CWS appreciates the opportunity to participate at properties that the city vacates or so entitles to do plastics recycling. San Jose is blessed to have great re recyclers who do a good job for the city. We appreciate that. Any questions, please? Thanks, Joel. Thank and you. thanks for your and your team's efforts to recycle. Um, okay, uh, I believe Mr. Beekman. I to use this space as a community information place. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, frac gas, uh, the use of frac gas is uh, 
will be needed for uh, the future of plastics. And I just wanted to remind that we're making a, a really good efforts to uh, leave frac gas in the 2020s. We have to really review how we use frac gas in the 2020s and um, where plastics fit into that. I guess I just thought I would note that here. And I guess to thank you for your own efforts and how you're, you're making incredible efforts in San Jose to leave natural gas and, and, and frac gas use. Uh, it'll just leave us open to much better choices for ourselves in the 2020s. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's nice to thank you as a, as a city government uh, in time like this for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the recommendation from the city manager's office is for prioritization. Councilman Kamison. Yes, uh, Mayor, thank you. And when I first took office, um, you know, we, we were taking a look at dry anaerobic digesters. I don't know if you recall that, uh, Mayor, and I thought it was one of the most brilliant ideas at the time and a great way to, uh, to take care of the methane uh, that, that, that comes out of our uh, waste stream. And um, ever since I, I heard about, you know, that everything's going on with China and, and all the stuff that we were actually shipping plastic all the way across the world, polluting the oceans, polluting the atmosphere. You know, we, we, was, I've been racking my brains to research things for the last few years. I did bring up other suggestions, but uh, we, our office worked with uh, Council Member Foley and Council Member Davis, and we created a memo that is being supported by uh, Kip Harkness, who uh, is enthusiastic about the opportunity to lead in this area of plastic recycling. These aren't the plastics that are clean and ready to go to China. <laughs> These are the plastics like half full ketchup bottles, mm -hmm. used utensils, and, and uh, you know, fi thin film uh, potato chip bags that cannot be recycled at all, even if you do take them to China. And so uh, these end up being in the, in the landfills uh, and polluting other parts of the, the city and, and clogging machinery and what have you. I've been talking to a lot of recyclers as well and, and doing this research. And I think this idea really fits uh, our plan in the city, uh, you know, to, to participate in the uh, climate accords, the, you know, the, the Paris climate accords. And I, I think it falls in line with our, our green um, uh, environmental um, plans here in the city. And I'm hoping that um, our city actually takes a lead on this as we have in the past on many other issues and, and, um, and devoting some portion of the land and asking staff to work uh, with uh, recyclers to uh, go forward and experiment on this idea and hopefully provide a, uh, a, a, a way to recycle plastic and into new usable plastic instead of using virgin plastic and basically drilling and, and refining oil for that, I think it'd be a, gr you know, we can use dirty stuff to create new materials. I think it's a, it's a great idea and I'm hoping that the whole uh, council supports this um, in, in, this, in the, um, I guess the weeks for, when, I don't know when we're gonna have the. Uh, the 25th, I believe. 25th. All right, so consider this your opening statement. It is <laughs> definitely my opening statement. Right. I'll, I'll bring my props again. <laughs> yeah, you can bring those props back. Yeah. Ketchup might be all used up by then. So I'll make a know motion. You started out this morning with a full bag of potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you, Councilor Campbell, for bringing this forward. I assume there's a motion there. Motion to uh, put forward to the uh, priority setting. Second. Second. Okay. And. Uh, Certainly interested in seeing what can happen through exploration here. Uh, full disclosure, I think, of course, we do own that land with another partner, that is the city of Santa Clara. Uh, and uh, obviously we've got some innovative partnerships like this. I know Bioselection, which is a great uh, small startup led by two brilliant women are doing similar work and though slightly different. Uh, and uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't consider it. Uh, Dave? Yeah, yeah, I think you hit on the issue though. The access to the property will need to, um, the council is going to be seeing this very soon as we uh, go through the process with Pond A18. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, actually, the property would need to be vacated and then sold. Um, and so someone would need to buy the property to, to locate the facility, unless all of our partners were in agreement that this was a regional wastewater facility related function. So there's a, quite a bit of complexity on the land side of it. and. Uh, I know that the issue here is is bigger than the land. It's it's more about how we manage uh, these type of recyclable materials. So, 
yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and ultimately, you know, we make, we were able to find the one-time money to be able to buy the land for ourselves, um, be able to do these kinds of pilots. That might be an interesting concept. Okay, uh, on the motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we'll move on. Um, we're now on to a referral uh, from Councilmember Jimenez on zoning code emergency shelter. And I believe uh, we have members of Councilmember Jimenez's team here. Would you like to speak, Helen? No, no, okay. So it's pretty self-evident. I think we saw this in the fall. It's brought back to us. Let's go to the community. Andrea Erden, followed by Paul Soto. Hi, Andrea. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing my voice here today. I think you all know, I know you all know, that we're in a crisis state right now with our homeless neighbors. Um, we're not providing the affordable housing, the solutions that are necessary to get people off the street and keep them safe. I know you're all aware of that and you're all doing everything you can. We have 1,291 shelter beds in this county in the cold weather months. And in the warm weather months, it drops to 799. We've got 6,100 homeless people in this very city alone. So do the math, it's just not enough. We need to decrease uh, zoning regulations that prevent us from allowing not just the build out, but allowing sh emergency shelter in our churches, in our communities, where people are anyway. So anything you can do to vote for this, I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and please know too that Home First is here as a partner to help the city. So as we move forward, if training is needed for churches and staff, we're more than happy to do it pro bono. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for walking the walk. Mr. Soto. Paul Soto, um, I'm glad that the, that the council is, is considering uh, this proposal, but like it's the, it's the last page on this, and I know of course that wasn't intentional, but it seems like you know this is symbolic, that dealing with the homeless issues is always the last issue to deal with, just like it's the last page on this uh, pamphlet. You know, um, the, the city is not, responding in a way that is commiserate with the urgency of the situation. You know, uh, Willow Glen had its choice. 16 people were trying to go over there to Hope Village, 16, nine of which were women. And I heard and I saw because I went to the Elks Lodge because I wanted to listen. I wanted to listen to the conversations. I wanted to listen how these people were talking. Redlining policies already segregated that area. You know, we already know how Willow Glen was established. And so now what they're doing is redlining via class, social class, economic class. This is, that's not okay. So what I would like to see is each one of the districts where the district has proximity to resources in the inner cities, every single one of those districts start bearing some weight, start carrying some weight. And the reason why I say that is because of how dangerous uh, Councilman Kamis' comment was yesterday. I sat there and I heard this man as a city councilman state, uh, well, I want to ask a question. Um, you know, these 1,200 people, you know, what I heard was that people choose to be homeless. That right there, those kinds of comments, that kills people. People die as a result of that kind of callous ruthlessness. And I don't think he realizes just how ruthless that comment was, but I did, and that's why I'm here. Uh, Karen Gillette, followed by Martha O'Connell and Scott Largent. I'll may ask may you. I say something, uh, uh, Mayor? Yeah, I'll ask you to respond in just a moment. I, I agree with what you're about to say, which is that it was taken completely out of context because I know you were citing somebody else who said exactly that. So I, I think I anticipate what you're about to say. Let's hear public comment first. <laughs> Sir, you've had your chance to speak. Ms. Gillette. Hello. Uh, I think most of you know me, uh, Karen Gillette, um, a member of uh, Winter Faith Collaborative, um, a faith-based faith organization uh, that, that coordinates uh, services for homeless in our city. Um, I, I'm trying to think of something new that I can say. I've spoken to you many times. Um, I think the main thing I'd like to say today is I urge you uh, to support uh, Sergio's memo. Um, we um, spoke four years ago uh, about having 
um, uh, uh, transitional villages in every council district. <clears throat> we keep speaking about that. I think this, his proposal uh, in his memo will help advance that process. Uh, another thing I would like to say, as I think I've um, presented to most of you, uh, this report uh, from the Seattle University School of Law it's titled, No Rest for the Weary, Why Cities Should Embrace Homeless Encampments. So, you know, that's another step that we could take. We could take uh, and bring water and um, uh, uh, garbage collection into the encampments and make them a much, much uh, better place uh, to live for people. Uh, there are a lot of things that we could do. Uh, the other thing is, uh, once we do choose a, uh, an operator um, uh, to run a project, uh, we could let that operator, like Home First with the BHC, they've hired some wonderful people to work uh, at the BHC project. Uh, but for some reason, um, the, the control uh, by our housing department continues, and, and I think that that's unfortunate. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mr. O'Connell? Ms. Ms. O'Connell, forgive me. Yeah, I wasn't prepared to speak on this, so I don't, I'm not going to be as coherent as I usually am. I rise in support of, of Sergio's memo. I will just tell you that last year, um, my eyes were really opened. There was a senior lady with severe medical issues, and she got evicted from... Um, a bedroom she was renting in a mobile home park, and she ended up living in her car. So I brought her down to housing, and there just wasn't any place for her then. There were all kinds of lists that she had to get on. So anything that is going to increase our ability to have shelters and other forms of supporting supportive housing, I encourage you to do. So please support Sergio's memo. Thank you. Uh, Scott Largen, followed by Blair, Blair Beacon. Okay, we'll, we'll figure it out. I have a loud voice. I, I was hoping um, that we might get a little more creative with things. I, uh, I'm on a ground level with all this stuff. I'm literally in the creeks. I'm at all these locations where all the homeless and mentally ill are at. Um, I'm excessively documenting it. And they need a temporary solution. And by rezoning things in certain areas, I mean, we can get creative with this right now to start pulling people off the streets. We have the ability right now to start detoxing meth addicts. It was like beating a dead horse for three years for our county to understand that they're not on boobs. They're on methamphetamines. So now that money's being put in that direction, we can start filling that place that was a sobering station that's now for meth detox. Okay, and we need a rehab the size of Costco. Okay, these people need drug help. They are not gonna get their lives back together unless they're off the meth. I spent two years working on my motorhome, and you guys have heard me talk about this motorhome forever, okay? I was a mechanic in a previous life. I could have had that motorhome running in one day. I worked on it for two years in your district, Chappie, mm -hmm. on the side of a street there, and never could figure it out because meth fried my brain so bad. So there's certain things people are unable to do. I tried to do things to get back into my child's life, to get into treatment. I was all over the place, hearing things, screaming, yelling, just out of my mind. And that's what two years on methamphetamines. And that's bad dope that's coming out of Mexican super labs from cartels. And it's poison. And I'm wondering when we're going to declare a health emergency, because this is not normal methamphetamines out there. You guys get down on that street level and just listen to the screams, watch the chaos. It's shocking. And my daughter's got to see this when she goes to visit me at the courthouse. My daughter's got to get out of a car there at St. James Park as my ex feeds that meter. Let's just figure something out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Sean, did, did you want to? Yeah, I, Mr. Beekman, I don't have a card for you, but feel free to come up after Mr. Beekman. Hi. Um, I just, uh, I wanted to really thank you guys for the uh, item last night where you uh, 
rejected the uh, hotel on Stockton Street. And that, that was an idea that had uh, a unique zoning to it. And I actually thought it was kind of an interesting use of uh, zoning. And I hope, uh, you know, the, the, the neighborhood committees were, you know, they responsive to ideas of affordable housing for that area. And, uh, you know, so if you can learn to apply that kind of ideas to, uh, to, to zoning for, for what this issue is about, uh, you'll really be on the right track of things. And um, thank you. Thank you again for, for your efforts uh, last night. And uh, it was a very uh, interesting uh, city council meeting yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just curious how short you think we all are. Um, I obviously support Sergio's memo. We definitely need as many areas rezoned or zoned so that we can build more shelters and things in the short term. If it just means that we have like the National Guard come in and erect a tent so that we can turn that into a temporary shelter, fine. But we need things that are immediate. 161 people died on our streets last year and that was the initial total. We don't even have the total yet for the people that died in December. But last year, 2018, 20 people alone died in December. So obviously our death rate just keeps ticking up and ticking up. And we just keep staying in the same box and doing the same old thing with the same old operators, the same old low bidder or only bidder. And we can't keep doing that. So doing this at least gets us out of that box. And if we can do that, then we can also look for different bidders. We need different providers and we need more options. And we need to treat this like the absolute emergency that it is. And we declared it an emergency. And that's all we did was declare an emergency and not treat it like an emergency. It's like we've got Ebola, but then we don't put on like the hazmat suits or anything like that. And I just think that that's been really shameful. Um, speaking of shameful, I just wanted to remind you, as my understanding of the Brown Act, is that we talk to you during public comment, and you don't talk back to us about the things that we say in public comment. Could be wrong about that. But, you know, if I say, like, I don't know, Dev's a total commie, Dev doesn't turn around and say, like, <laughs> I am not a commie. See, I appreciate that, Dev. I knew you'd take that well. Um, She's not so, a commie. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Dev was the perfect one to use for that. Yeah. So, but as far as the, that's my understanding of uh, the Brown Act. So it's normally that we say things and then you don't respond to us during public comment. So anyway, I support Sergio's. Uh, memo and I hope that it works and we need more things like this. We need as many places where we can build shelters to prevent people <coughs> dying because we're doing a crappy job of that so far. Thank you. Uh, Joanne Ponte will allow uh, Rick to opine about what the Brown Act does or doesn't require. Okay, hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm Joanne Price. I represent Life Moves. Oh, forgive Life me, Joanne. Moves. I mispronounced your last Yeah, time. I'm with Life Moves and I just want to say that thank you for the memo, Sergio. I think this is a really smart tool and a very um, simple tool that can be implemented. Having just gone through two city processes to add 15 beds at a couple of our shelters in San Jose, going through a whole change use permit had months to the process. If we could get by right and open up the districts where we can build by right, 50 beds is a small enough solution that can fit easily within communities and neighborhoods. And every 50 bed shelter could probably house about 15 clients. Right now in the point in time count, there was 98 families reported as being unsheltered in San Jose. So eight little modular units of 50 beds could easily help solve that problem. So thank you for your consideration. I think it's a smart solution. Thank you. Uh, returning to the panel, uh, Rick, I don't believe there's any prohibition in the Brown Act. Is no, no the, what's, what's prohibited is the council can't debate amongst itself or uh, take any action with respect to an item not on the agenda and the public comment is that yeah. with respect to any com any questions from the mayor or the ca uh, individual council member or a comment from the mayor or individual council, council member, that's permitted. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Councilman Cameron. Well, I, I, I take big issue with what was just said. Uh, I've been out there and I uh, approving every single housing project since I've been in office. Um, I have, actually my name was on the memo that allowed housing in churches. My, um, my goal has always been to help those who need this shelter. 
I've approved two projects in my district. They haven't been built, but they've been approved. I, um, I, I, the, the, the comment that I made yesterday were words that were said by County Executive Smith. And if the county is not, it, it shows you that the county is not serious. I 100% I do not agree with Jeff Smith when his assertion is that those people who are homeless are homeless by choice. Those are not my words. Those are the county executives, and you can go online, look at my YouTube video because I recorded this when he said it. Um, I put it online on the YouTube, uh, Johnny Camus on the record. You can go and listen to his words, not mine. And I question that, I question that because the county is supposed to be the biggest uh, uh, organization that's supposed to be taking care of homelessness because they own the hospitals. They own the drug rehabilitation facilities. They own a lot of the things that the city does not do. They don't, the city does not treat meth addicts. The city does not provide hospital beds. The county does. We need their help. All we do is we build housing and we have been doing that for years. So I take real issue with, with uh, being uh, demonized here uh, and, and uh, quite frankly, I was there protesting uh, the demolition of the 160-unit potential building uh, uh, that, 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 was, that Sobrato wanted to convert the old city hall, the old city hall annex that could have been converted into a 160-unit uh, transitional housing. It could have been open and it just coincidentally 160 people died last year. They also voted to demolish a 674-unit jail after they build their new jail. Councilman Cameron, I know now where we are getting a little bit far off the yes. topic. So, so I, 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 um, I just take off. issue, and I, I, and, I'm, and, and I am answering the public's question. Um, and I, I just want that person to know that, that this council takes, <coughs> takes this issue very seriously. And I don't necessarily agree with everything in, in um, Councilmember Perales' memo, but I'm willing to entertain it. Uh, but I want it to be seen um, in the light that we are. This council has, has always been serious about tackling this issue. We've always been serious, and we're doing our best. But if partners don't step up, then shame on them. All right. Uh, comments on this memorandum? All right. Uh, I believe the recommendation from the city manager is that it goes to the prioritization next week. Is that right? Yeah, could I just add a little context? I, yeah. I really, because um, I think it's important, I, I don't really have an explanation on, on why it took so long to get here. This Council Member Jimenez brought this forward in November, so we should have been talking about this sooner. Um, at, just reminding the committee, though, that our process here is to evaluate the workload associated with it. It's not a value assessment, and definitely this needs to go to priority setting and really that's the best chance for us to be able to get this work done is right. on priority setting. Okay. And uh, I see Michael Brio's here, so I thought I'd take advantage of his knowledge in case he happens to know off the top of his head. Uh, can you tell us, I know we have expanded shelters Come zoning. Come on up, Mike, please. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I know we've expanded shelters zoning to enable churches to do so. But is that just for temporary basis or does that include permanent shelter? Yeah, this is Michael Brio from the Department of Planning, Building, Code Enforcement. He usually introduces himself right as he sits down. And he just needs a I'm chance Michael, to do that. Michael Brio from Planning. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. So my understanding is what we've done. We we've done a safe parking ordinance, which allows people to live or to reside in their vehicles um, on church parking lots or not churches. It could be places of worship, parking lots of places of worship. So we do we do allow that. Okay, but but not shelter construction. Um, that's something uh, that we're, we're considering, actually, in terms of we're, we're exploring that now. I thought we liberalized the rules. I, to be I honest, I have to get back to you on that. I have churches in my district. Yeah, yeah so I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that part okay. of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, because I remember going through all of that. Yeah. In fact, yeah. some of the folks in this room were yeah. pushing yeah. with us. Yeah, we're just sheltering in existing gyms or wherever. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Uh, so more work ahead. Uh, on the motion, oh, is there a motion, Councilman Ramirez? I just want to, um, and this came back from feedback from some of the advocates who were um, at yesterday's council meeting, and um, this is my oversight um, in terms of not putting a, a time certain some of these uh, 
uh, issues that, uh, in regards to our unhoused community and so that our advocates can be there. I think we took quite a bit of a time yesterday and we, we stayed there until 12 uh, midnight. Uh, so it was a long meeting, um, but I apologize for, for not having a time certain. And hopefully, you know, we will, I'll make sure that as, when I'm here at Rolls, I'll make sure that we're more cognizant of that. So thank you for your support. That, w that was a statement that I was going to make. And um, if there's not a motion, motion to approve. Great. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, moving forward. Okay, we're on to open forum. Uh, I have Martha O'Connell, Paul Soto, and Blair Beacon. Uh, I'm requesting a, a time certain uh, for early evening for the mobile home issue. Okay, please don't put it at the end of the, of the night because the seniors will not be there. They will leave. I'm sorry, Martha, are you referring to February? I think it's March 10th. Oh, March 10th. All so right. So if you could do that, that would so be So we'll try to put a note fabulous. in the ticket so it comes back. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's for the, okay, Paul? Also, though, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to do any back and forth other than to say that I know what I heard and I know that it was prefaced to, uh, for moral and ethical cover. Oh, well, I'm going to quote someone else, but I'm going to say it. And this is said, I'm not saying that he said it as a citizen. He said it as a man with power, that wields power in this city. That's why it's so critical to, to keep that kind of language checked. Because a person with power in this city expressing that kind of sentiment by virtue of the fact that you used your power in order to repeat that alone, you need to claim it. You're not going to shovel out that responsibility onto someone else. You were the one that said it. You were the one that said it. Not Jeff Garcia in this context. He said it in this context. And that's why I take offense because that kind of language literally kills people. Edmund Burke stayed. Edmund Burke stated, the only thing for evil to exist is for good men to do nothing. That's all that's necessary, is all we need to do is just neglect the situation. And that could be, that could be very clearly outlined and seen in the way that this council has dealt with this particular issue. They're not really accepting the fact that there is a direct causation, not correlation, causation between the, uh, the rising rents, the poverty that exists, and the systematic way in which poverty exists because a person just doesn't magically end up in the creek. There is a process by which that happens and it's a slow deterioration of the mind, of the body, and of the soul. That's what I'm talking about and, 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 and what, what I know you guys are in the a, in a, in a business of legislating things legally, but what I'm talking about is morals and ethics. I'm not talking about legalities. Because the person in the creek and the person in the tent doesn't care about it. Their laws don't exist for people that are literally fighting for their lives. All right, uh, Blair Bakeman. All right, thank you. Uh, to try to go over my, uh, my words from Thursday Smart City Committee, uh, I got bu I bumbled my words a bit towards the end in trying to talk about IoT practices. And uh, I just wanted to try to make clear here that, um, you know, we're practicing large corporate structures with IoT and technology at this time. And uh, my, I feel the guidelines that I work with uh, really work towards, uh, if we practice them well, it can bring large corporate structures into small small uh, startups and stuff like that. And it can be a way for, you know, it just organization for all parts of the community, not just the corporations, but everyday people, you know, intermixing with those corporations to have a good set of rules of the road and, and good accountability and understandings what, what, what we work towards. And uh, that's kind of what I wanted to say about uh, at the Smart Cities Committee meeting last time. So I, good luck in your efforts towards accountability. And um, uh, I, with 45 seconds, uh, I was really impressed by the council study session on um, 
equity. And it's my, um, it's my real hope that uh, Raul Peral has nicely mentioned uh, yesterday at council about uh, with wage theft issues. We're all hoping for better wage theft issues uh, practices. And Raul Peral has nicely mentioned uh, how he feels the public needs to be more involved with that process. I hope we can apply that to the equity ideas and have a really good summer about how it can be a, a community experience. You know, even as you have, we can all agree on your centralized ideas at this time with the budget. You know, maybe we can grow community ideas as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Largent. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Scott Largent. Uh, at the county meetings, their um, attendance is not mandatory. And the first time that, well, I mean, a couple of times before that, I went out there on a sidewalk with a megaphone, but I went out there to try to get the police department to show up to county meetings. When I would go to the Jail Diversion and Behavioral Health Subcommittee of the Reentry Network, you guys had a deputy chief there, Shawnee Williams, that was a no-show for two and a half years, okay? He received emails from me, phone calls. I was out on that sidewalk with that bullhorn, did the same thing with the big chief's window. I kept wondering why these people were not there. And at that same time is when I started filling out those little forms to actually try to talk to you, Sam. I figured, hey, talk to the person in charge, start asking him questions why his people aren't there. Then I realized the chain of command maybe start going through the city manager. And that's why I showed up over at your office. I started kind of filling out the forms, just kind of asking, why are people not showing up? Now, if your people were there at these committees, they would have realized that booze is not the problem and that the arrests were related to methamphetamines, being able to provide that information. And I understand what you're saying, uh, Johnny, about the, you know, the county needing to do more, but when you guys aren't there, they don't get that feedback that they need. And now we've got this you know, station right now that's gonna start detoxing meth addicts, but it's three years later when it's absolutely out of control right now. I'm not just blaming it all on the city of San Jose. They should have been doing more to contact all of you to say your people weren't there. How does this slip through the cracks? And I understand Shawnee Williams, Shawnee No Show Williams is now a police chief up in Vallejo. I just don't know why we re reward um, Failure like that, it might sound weird, they did not show up for years. Start looking over the attendance on the county site. You can see the attendance on there. I think that it should be more or less mandatory. Thank you. Thank you. Meetings adjourned.